Indeed, would you take your Bible and turn tonight to the New Testament, to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, and we're studying on Sunday night the seasons of our life, and tonight we're looking at a season that most people face at one time or another. It's the season of financial drought. It's been said if your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. And certainly that is true. And we're going to look, we can look at many different passages of Scripture that speak about this subject of stewardship, but there's one that is very instructive in Philippians chapter 4, and it provides encouragement and instruction for dealing with our stewardship, and that's verse 19 of chapter 4 in Philippians. Let's stand together to express our thanks to God and honor His Word. And notice chapter 4, the 19th verse, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. One little verse, and yet in that verse we see here the secret to overcoming the season of financial drought. Let's pray together. Our Father, take your word tonight and impart it to our hearts that we may apply your word. Let your Holy Spirit speak deep to us and give us understanding and a desire to heed. For we ask it in the name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please have a seat. Now I want you to look at that verse with me tonight. Look carefully at it and let's think about it. It says, and my God shall supply all your need. Circle that little word, all. All your need. That little word, all, means all. It means every part of the whole. It means there is not one need in our life that God will not supply. If you understand that, say amen. That's exactly what it says. God has promised to meet all of our needs. Then look at the verse again. And my God shall supply all your need. Shall supply. Circle the word shall. In other words, it says God will. It doesn't say God might. It says God will. There's not a question mark here. There's an exclamation point. It does not say that God's going to think it over and get back to us with his decision. It says God shall supply. God will. That's a promise. Right in the margin of your Bible there beside the word shall, promise. Because that's a promise from God. God has promised to do something. Look at the verse again. And my God shall supply all your wants. Is that what your Bible says? No, mine either. What does it say? Need. All your need. Now, circle the word need. There's a difference between what we need and what we want. And Scripture teaches us God is not going to give us everything that we want, but God will supply everything we need. The Bible tells us something else here. Look look again at verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. In other words, he will supply all our needs, not based on our assets, but based on his assets. Look at what it says, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, this is a promise, but it's not a promise for everybody. This is a promise God has made to believers. It is a promise God has reserved to people of faith, to those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus. God makes this promise. Now, you may be thinking, well, I'm a Christian, and I still have 
financial needs? Why are my needs not being met? Well, here's the answer. The answer is very simple. There are some conditions that come with this promise. In every promise God makes, there is a premise. In every promise God makes, God says, I'll make you this promise. If you'll do this, I'll do this. And so here is a promise that God makes, and with this promise, there is a premise. God says, if you will meet these requirements, I will meet your needs, and you will not have a season of financial drought. Now, there are three requirements, and they're really simple. Sometimes they're so simple, we miss them in Scripture. Here's the first one. Ask God for help. Isn't that simple? Just ask God for help. That's the first condition. God is waiting for you and me to ask him for help. The Lord never shuts his storehouse until we shut our mouth. God is asking us to ask him for for help. Over and over the Bible tells us that. It says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. God wants us to ask. And one of the reasons why we see so few miracles in our lives is simply because we do not ask. Instead of living a a life based on Christ, when it comes to stewardship, many folks live a life based on credit. We have a little thing called credit cards. And when we want something, I didn't say when we need something. When we want something in our life, instead of stopping and talking it over with God, so often before we even think about asking God about it, we just get that credit card out and we use it. And let me tell you, that is bondage. Credit cards will bind you up and make you a slave. If you understand what I'm saying, say amen. If you want to see God work in your life, pray for it before you pay for it. Pray and ask God what you should do. Do you pray about major purchases before you make them? Or do you just go to that credit card? James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. And we should ask God first. Jesus said, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full, the fullest possible joy. Now, God is a loving father and God wants to bless us because he is a loving father. Do you not love to give your children gifts? Does that not bring pleasure to you to give your children gifts? Well, God is that way with us. God is a giver. In fact, greatest verse in the Bible says that God is a giver. For God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave. He gave us his only begotten son. So we have to give him an opportunity to meet our needs. Ask God for help. And it is in the asking that we grow in our faith. God knows what we need before we ask. Then why does he tell us to ask? Because God is interested in growing our faith. And part of asking and receiving is the process of growing our faith. Here's a second condition God says to this promise that he makes. Learn to be content with what you have. Learn to be content with what you have. God is much more interested in our character than in our comfort. Did you know that? He he really is. Now, what is contentment? Contentment does not mean you don't have any financial plans. Every believer ought to set financial goals. The Bible says we ought to plan. The book of Proverbs is filled with principles of stewardship, of of spending and investing and tithing and saving. And all of these principles must be learned and they must be followed if we're going to have God's blessing in our life. Contentment means our happiness does not depend upon our circumstances. Did you hear what I said? Contentment means our happiness does not depend upon our circumstances. How do you know when you are not content? When you're not content, you fall victim to when and then thinking. Now think about this. When I get this, then I'm going to be happy. No, you're not. 
Now, the devil lulls us into believing that, but you see, the Bible teaches that things do not bring lasting happiness. The way to learn to be content is to eliminate the causes of discontentment in our life. What is the cause of discontent? What is the cause of discontentment in our life? It's always the same, always has been, always will be. Comparing is the cause of discontentment. Comparing. We compare everything in this nation that we live in. We compare our lawns. We compare our cars. We compare our spouses. We compare our clothes. We even compare the education of our kids. We are incessantly comparing everything around us. And whenever you compare, you're always going to be discontent. Stop comparing yourself to others. If you hear me, say amen. You know what I'm talking about. You get a new TV and you think it's great. Then you go next door and your neighbor's got one twice as big, one of these plasma TVs with hidden speakers and and surround sound, and all of a sudden you go home and your TV is not that great anymore. Comparing always gets us in trouble. We have to learn to be content. Look at Philippians 4.12. Philippians 4.12, Paul said, I know how to be a base. And I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He's saying there, I've learned the secret of contentment. He's learned to be content. It's something that we have to learn. It does not come natural. Human nature is discontent. It does not come natural for us. So God wants us to learn to be content with what we have. And he says if we'll ask him, and if we learn to be content with what we have, he'll meet our, our needs. Jot down 1 Timothy 6, and let me read you a couple verses. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8 says, There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we bring nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. That's true. How many of you brought anything into this world? None of us did. And uh, I was there when my two kids were born. They didn't bring anything into the world except a good pair of lungs. That was it. And we don't bring anything into the world. We don't take anything out of the world. I've conducted about 300, close to 300 funerals. I've never seen anybody take anything out of this world. I knew a couple folks who thought they would. I thought they could, but they never did. And one of the greatest secrets in our life is learning to be happy and have peace of mind. And if you want to learn that, then what you have to realize is this. None of us own anything. None of us. You say, now wait a minute. You've gone too far, preacher. That deed to my house, it's in my name. Whose will it be in 50 years? It'll be, whose will it be in a thousand years? It'll be dust. It'll turn to dust or it'll turn to rust. And we don't own anything. In fact, God just loans it to us for a period of time. We didn't bring a single thing into the world and we're not going to carry a single thing out. And the Bible calls that stewardship. The Bible says that we are the manager or the steward of what God allows us to have while we are on this earth that it is not really ours. It is His. And when we begin to understand that we're just a manager of the blessings that God allows in our life, then we hold them with an an open hand and we're not uptight about losing them. And that's what it means to learn to be content. Now listen, if you're only interested in using your wealth for personal selfishness, why should God help you with that? Why should he? If you buy into the myth of thinking that more will make you happier, why should God affirm that myth in your life? If you think that life really consists of he who dies with the most toys wins, God's not going to subsidize your addiction. He's not going to do that. God's not under any obligation to meet your needs if you think that's what your finances are all about. If you understand, say amen. Now listen. 
God will not indulge our selfishness. But God does watch our attitude. In the scripture, the Bible teaches that God watches our attitude. He watches all these things, and, and it's an acid test to the Lord of our faith. Do you know why? It's simply because we try, we spend our entire life wrapped up in this stewardship thing. And if we don't learn contentment, Scripture says we'll never be happy. I want to share with you some of the voices of the past, people who've been on the top. Listen to what they said. John D. Rockefeller, one of the wealthiest men in American history, said, I have made many, many, many millions, but they brought me no happiness. I would barter it all away for the days when I sat on the stool in Cleveland and counted myself rich on $3 a day. That's what he had to say. John Vanderbilt said, the care of $200 million is a burden too great for any brain or back to bear. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I'd like to try it for a day or two. But no, no, you wouldn't. He knew what he was talking about. Andrew Carnegie said, millionaires seldom smile. Have you ever thought about that? Some of the saddest people that I have known in my life have been the wealthiest people. And some of the happiest people that I have known have been those who had very little because they had learned to be content. Here's the third thing God says. If he's going to meet our needs, we must practice biblical giving. Practice biblical giving. Now, I know that some people turn a preacher off when he talks about this subject, but I want you to remember, you're not turning me off, you're turning God off because I'm just the mouthpiece and I'm just going to share with you what God says in His Word. And here's something I want you to remember. Mature Christians practice biblical giving. Baby Christians do not. I want you to get that. I'm going to say it again. Mature Christians practice biblical giving. Baby Christians do not. As hard as it is, can you say amen? Amen. It's very true. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians for a moment. 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. And we're going to spend just a few minutes here, and then we'll be finished. 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, beginning with verse 6. And here we see what the Bible teaches us, particularly about cheerful giving. 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. There it is. Write it down. If you ever feel pressured to give, don't. Did you hear that? If you ever feel pressured to give, don't. The Bible says God loves a what? Cheerful giver. You know, you just have to put a smile on your face to say that word. God loves a cheerful giver. Now look, God is not looking at the amount that we give. God is looking at the attitude with which we give it. And if you're giving out of pressure or giving out of guilt, it doesn't count. So don't. Don't. God loves a cheerful giver. The principle of sowing and reaping applies to every area of life, not just our stewardship. What we sow in life, we're going to reap. What we deposit in life will be returned to us. If we sow criticism, we're going to reap criticism. If we sow kindness, we're going to reap kindness. It's the law of the harvest. If I plant apple seeds, I don't get pears, I get apples. If I plant pear seeds, I don't get oranges, I get pears. Whatever I sow, I'm going to reap in life. And the Bible says if we sow generosity, then we're going to reap it. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. And God has set it up that way. God has set it up when we give it to Him, He multiplies it back to us. That is a biblical principle 
that is as certain as the law of gravity in this physical universe in which we live. The amazing thing, though, is this. We do not just reap what we sow, we reap more than we sow. In the physical world, for example, if you plant two bushels of wheat, are you going to get back two bushels? No. You can expect an average of 67 bushels back. If you plant three bushels of oats, you will harvest on average 79 bushels of oats in return. If you plant seven and a half pounds of corn, you will reap 120 bushels of corn back. And God set it up that way. You know why? Because God wants us to be like Him. God is a giver. And the only way we're ever going to become like Jesus is to be the way God is. And when we're stingy, we're like the devil. The devil is stingy. So the principle is, when I hold on tightly to what I've got, that's all I've got. But when I let it go and give it away... God multiplies it. Amen? That's what God is teaching us in His Word. Now, some say, when all my needs are met, then I'll start giving. Well, your needs will never be met because it doesn't work that way. It's just the opposite. When you start giving, all your needs will be met because there's a premise to the promise. God says, meet these conditions and I'll make you a promise that I will meet all of your needs. But you have to follow his word in order to experience that. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and he will fill your barns. Now, that's the principle of tithing. Tithing is a principle, by the way, that's taught throughout Scripture from the book of Genesis when Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, who I believe was the pre-incarnate Christ. And it all goes back to God. Tithing in Scripture is an act of worship. That's what it is. It's worshiping God. Now, why did God say give him 10%? Well, I don't know. He could have said 50%. He could have said 90%. God is God. And God can do what God wants to do. And God said give him 10%. And does God need our money? No. God absolutely does not need our money, but God wants our worship. And our worship is important to Him. And one of the ways we worship is to tithe unto the the Lord. Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart shall be also. Now I'm going to say something here and I want you to listen. I don't care how much you claim that Jesus Christ is first in your life. If you're not tithing, He is not first in your life. Did you hear that? You can say he's first, but if you're not being obedient to his word, he is not first in your life. And where we put our time and where we put our money determines what is first in our life. I've had people say, I've had people here in this church to say to me, well, I can't afford to tithe. Friend, you can't afford not to. I mean, don't, don't say that you can't afford to because when you say that, you're going right against what God teaches in His Word. You see, if you want God to meet your needs, you have to put Him first. If you want God to bless your family, then you put Him first in your family. If you want God to bless a relationship, you put Him first in that relationship. And if you want God to bless your stewardship, you put Him first in your stewardship. Matthew 6.33 says, Your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well what you need, and He will give it to you if you give Him first place in your life and live as He wants you to. There was a farmer who was known for his generosity, and his friends could not understand how he gave so much away and yet remained so prosperous. One day, one of his friends said, we can't understand you. You give far more away than the rest of us, and yet you always seem to have more to give. He said, well, that's easy to explain. He said, I keep shoveling into God's bin, and God keeps shoveling into mine, but God has a bigger shovel. And that's so true. And that's what Scripture is teaching tonight. 
Let's go back to where we started. The Bible says in Philippians 4.19 that God shall supply all of our needs. That's the promise. Here's the premise. If we ask God for help, if we learn to be content with what we have, and if we practice biblical giving. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together. And tonight, the invitation is twofold. The invitation is for anyone here who does not know Jesus as Savior to open your heart to Him and receive Him as Lord of your life. If you'll make that decision as we sing, you step forward. And by your coming, you're receiving Christ as your Savior. There may be someone here who would like to be part of our church family. And the first step is for you to come forward. We invite you to come as we sing.